Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Paula Diaconescu, um, and I'm part of the NSF Center for Integrated Catalysis. And today is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Lloyd Doe, from University of um, Houston, uh, Texas. Lloyd it, was born in Vietnam of Chinese parents. Um, but he moved to San Jose, California when he was six. Um, so that's why uh, some of you heard me. I said um, that he is actually from California, living in Texas. Um, in 2006, he got his Bachelor of Science from University of California, San Diego, where he worked with um, Seth Cohen. And then he moved to MIT, um, where in 2011, he got his PhD. During this time, he worked with uh, Steve Lippert. So I'm going to say now before I forget, Loy is our also resident bioinorganic chemist. Um, not only because he did his PhD in bioinorganic chemistry, but also because his group is very interested in transition metal biocatalysis in addition to organometallic chemistry. Um, in, after he got his PhD, he moved to Caltech where he worked with uh, John Burka. He had an NIH fellowship. And I think during this time I met uh, Loy, I think at one, some party uh, that was associated with Caltech. Um, in 2013, he started his independent career as an assistant professor at the University of Houston. And in 2019, he beca became um, associate professor. So that's very, um, not, not too long ago, although we were saying the whole pandemic makes uh, time feel very stretched, right? So it feels like it was ages ago. Um, Loy was uh, awarded for his, uh, well, his and his independent and work and his group's uh, work in 2015, the Younger Chemist Award of the ACS Greater Houston section. In 2018, the NSF uh, Career Award and then also in 2018, he got um, an award from uh, his university. It's uh, called the NSM Junior Faculty Award for Excellence in Research, which is basically a faculty award from the College of Natural Sciences and uh, Mathematics. As I alluded, and as you're going to see today, um, Lo is a very interesting, um, well, Loy's research interests, I should say, <laughs> are a very interesting blend of organometallic chemistry. I think there is, um, despite the fact that we call organometallic chemistry, chemistry of metals, there's nothing more organometallic than ligand design um, in organometallic chemistry. Um, and also, like I said, bioinorganic um, chemistry and even, and not just bioinorganic on the inorganic side, but actually um, very interested in biocatalysis. Um, and with that, I think um, he has some, a few surprises prepared for us during the talk. And also I want to tell everybody at the end, before questions, we will um, have breakout rooms. So they, we will get a sign and we'll get together about, I think four or five um, of us, and then we'll come back and get to ask him questions. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the seminar and Lloyd, uh, well, not the floor, but the screen is yours. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Paul, for that really nice and very detailed introduction. Um, I'm extremely thrilled to give this webinar today on ligand design. This is a topic that's been very near and dear to me, as you'll see throughout my uh, chemical training and career. So before we begin, it seems to be stuck at this page. Um, we're, we'd like to get a little bit more information for of the audience. And so we'd like to do a live audience poll. And that is if you could answer this question, which statement best describes your interest in learning about ligand design? Is it important in your current research? Is it important in your previous research? Or perhaps you're thinking about incorporating that in your future work. And option D is that you're here simply because you're interested on the, in this topic, which is perfectly fine as well. So just please take a, a few moments to answer that prompt. Uh, 
Okay, fantastic. So can we share this with everybody or only I can see it? Everyone can see it. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah, so it looks like um, we have a good mix of um, people from different backgrounds. So of course, you're all welcome. And hopefully, um, we'll have some very engaging discussions at the end um, in the breakout session. Okay, so I thought the best way, to, well, well, first, before I begin, um, I wanted to ask or to define what a ligand is. And so according to Miesler and Tarr in their inorganic te chemistry textbook, a ligand is an atom, an ion, or a molecule that can donate electrons to metals. So this definition is, is very simple, but ligands play um, an extraordinary number of, of different roles in inorganic chemistry. So here is just a, a, a one of my favorite example of a metal complex supported by a crown ether ligand. You can see that the metal is coordinated by the oxygen atoms and it even has solvent molecules at the axial sites. So ligands can do many different things. For example, they can make metals, metal ions soluble. They can define the structure to the electronics, enforce chirality. For catalyst design, being able to control reactivity is also extremely important. In some cases, we could make uh, metals luminescent um, by attaching fluorophores, or sometimes the metal itself is, is luminescent, um, and many others that are not on this list. So I thought uh, the best way to kind of give you a background about um, my own research and, and kind of how I think about living design is to tell you sort of the, the stories of, of, of um, what I've done in, in the past. So as an undergraduate student, as Paul had mentioned, I work with Seth Cohen at the University of California, San Diego, who's was a, a really fantastic advisor. And with Seth, my project was to construct supermolecular assemblies using metallodiprins. So this was the early days of the, the moth field. And so I really got a taste of um, what that chemistry is like. So these metallodiprins um, are simply half a porphyrin, basically. They have these two parole units. And in the complex that we studied, we looked at these copper squared planar compounds with these ACAC supporting ligands as well. But the research question um, that we were exploring was um, how can we control the self-assembly of these complexes by simply changing the position of this thal ether donor. So we found that if we had the thal ether at the meta position, that spontaneously they form these head to tail dimers. So here is the molecular structure of one of the copper complex and here's a second complex. And you can see that the sulfur atom is coordinating to a neighboring um, copper ion and they're forming sort of the sandwich like structure. We found that when we simply move the position of the thal ether to the para position, we were able to obtain these um, linear coordination polymers. So in this picture, I was sort of truncated at this, but it's basically an infinite chain of these metallodiprin units. So remember, um, this was you know when I was still an undergrad, and so I, I was really excited by this. You know, I got the chance to learn how to do organic chemistry. I got to make all sorts of really um, highly colored um, inorganic complexes. I got to grow crystals. And so this really drew me into research and I had to give Seth a lot of credit for um, where I am now, um, for why I, I pursued the career that I did. And so um, for my PhD, I decided to move across to the, the East Coast to work with uh, Steve Lippert at MIT. And uh, Lippert is very well known in the bioinorganic community specifically for his studies of this enzyme called methane monooxygenase. So the project goal um, for my PhD work was to develop synthetic models of this enzyme called NMO, but specifically the active site of this enzyme. So first of all, what is so interesting about this enzyme? Well, it can catalyze this very unusual uh, reaction that's highly selective. So it can take a very inert hydrocarbon methane and activate it with O2 to selectively form methanol. And remember this reaction can be done under physiological conditions, right? So low temperature, low pressure, and these are conditions that we can't actually mimic synthetically. So there's a lot of um, scientific interest in learning how this chemistry works in the, the native protein um, environment and native uh, protein system. So the, um, the enzyme, the workhorse of this enzyme is the methane monooxygenase hydroxylase component. But as an inorganic chemist, we're really fascinated by the presence of a dying core embedded within this active site. So we take a really close look at the active center. We see 
this metal cluster. And um, as depicted here, the two orange spheres for iron atoms, and then these ligands are actually side chains for the amino acids. So we see that there are these nitrogen donors that are uh, bound in kind of a syn fashion. We've got these carboxylate groups that come from aspartate and glutamate side chains. So as an inorganic chemist, this is a really fascinating cluster because if you simply just take an iron salt and combine it with carboxylates and imidazole groups um, and try to grow crystals, you're not likely to get this, this highly organized cluster. And so this is where ligands come in because we want to be able to use a ligand to kind of reinforce that cluster in order for us to generate a, a synthetic mimic of this active site, which will allow us hopefully to study and to understand this chemistry a little bit better. And so um, when, I, when I started in this project, it, it took a couple of years to design the right ligand, but one of the ideas that we had was, what if we had something like this, where we have the, the two pyridine groups that are, are linked together by this final benzene linker, and then by having a phenolate group, we can perhaps kinetically stabilize the irons to kind of fix it in a dion core. So conceptually, the idea was relatively simple. We would just introduce a equivalent of this di-iron pre precursor. This is just mesotyl. Um, it's a really nice precursor because it also deprotonates the hydroxides. And we'd also add two equivalents of a carboxylic acid. And our goal ultimately is to be able to obtain a structure that looks something like this, where we can try to mimic kind of the coronation environment of the native, native protein. Unfortunately, um, when, I, when I tried these reactions, I, I made this ligand and I metallated this, but I was never actually able to obtain the desired product. And in all cases, despite all the different carboxylates I had tried and all the reaction conditions, um, I always obtained this, this ligand di-iron complex. So you can see that um, in, the, in the black, there's one ligand and the gray in the back, we see another ligand. So they're sort of intercalating in a way um, but it bridges these two irons in this extremely stable complex. Okay, so at this point, uh, we also were able to confirm the uh, structure by crystallography and also by solution metal binding studies. And so, you know, of course, this was a very disappointing result, um, but that led us to go back to the drawing board and think about, well, how can we prevent this from happening? Because um, this is a thermodynamic product, right? So what can we do to modify our ligand to achieve the structure that we actually want? So the solution that I came up with was to create a macro cycle. The idea here is that if these, this ligand is not open, there's no way that you can intercalate two macro cycles together. And so maybe that provides an opportunity now for us to fix that dying core that we want. Another modifi modification that I added was to replace the pyridines with these imine groups. And the reason for this is mostly for a synthetic uh, ease of synthesis, because to, to form macrocycles is really difficult to do, um, to have a, a pyridine here, whereas imine cyclization is, is um, well precedented in the literature. So we thought this would be a, a nice um, way to access that bizarre structure. So um, with this in hand, we metallate this compound with iron acetyl and two equivalents of carboxylic acid. And these reactions were performed in organic solvents, specifically in T-Chef in this case. And so to my amazement, we were able to grow crystals of, of this complex. And here is the molecular structure. So you can see the outline is the macrocycle with the imine in the, in the blue and then the phenolate in the red. But more amazingly is that the carboxylates were able to bridge in an eta one, in an eta one, eta two fashion on the top, and then on the bottom we have a second carboxylate that's a little bit hard to see here, um, but they do bridge these two iron atoms. And the reason that I was so excited about this result is because it, it was a very good structural mimic of the reduced form of the um, the na natural enzyme MMO. Um, uh, the, in the natural enzyme, we do see coordination of a, of a water molecule at this um, iron site right here, but in the organic solvents, uh, we didn't see any coordination, plus it's probably too sterically bulky. Of course, there are some differences, right? The um, imidazole nitrogen is not quite the same as a, um, the imine nitrogen is not quite the same as an imidazole. The phenolate is not quite the same as the carboxylate. So I, I think there, we still have a long way to go in terms of getting a functional mimic, but at least it was a, a, the right step, uh, a good step in the right direction. 
So for, fast forward a few years um, after my PhD, I decided I wanted to learn about um, catalysis from more of an industrial point of view. And so um, working with John Burkhall seemed really attractive. I've been a, a great admirer of his work. And so with, with John's, in John's lab, one of my projects was to investigate the mechanism of ethylene trimerization by chromium catalysts. And the chromium catalysts that we were interested in are these chromium PMP supported complexes. Um, and what they do is that you can activate them with um, MAO, which is basically just a um, um, aluminum alkyl source that activates these, that displaces these chlorides. But what's amazing about these chromium catalysts is that they selectively take three equivalents of ethylene and selectively convert it to one hexene. And one hexene is an extremely valuable commodity chemical, so there's a lot of interest in trying to understand this chemistry and to improve on, on its efficiency. However, as a um, organometallic chemist, we were um, very interested in, in knowing the how. How does this reaction work and what is the active species? So for studies of mechanism, I'll have to point you to Teo Gopi's really nice work um, reported in these two, two papers. Um, but when I joined the group, I really wondered what is in this, this black box here, right? What does this active form of the, the chromium species look like? For example, what is the oxidation state? What is this geometry? And what is this coordination environment? And so to answer these questions, we have to use um, some spectroscopic probes probably to, to assess these characteristics. However, the problem with studying the parent complex is that it's not very soluble. So if I do low temperature studies, I, I could never get a very high concentration in the complex. So that made characterization very difficult. But fortunately, um, the ligand design here is simply just to add um, some more solubilizing groups. And the solution that I found was simply to replace a methyl group on the backbone of the nitrogen with C18 chain. So this made it a lot greasier. And in addition, I also attached these tert butyl groups at the pair position. So notice that chemically um, or structurally, we don't really perturb the primary coordination environment. I'm adding substituents in sort of the periphery of the complex to improve the solubility. And this was extremely important for low temperature studies. And so I wanna kind of give you a quick um, a summary of, of the result here. This is, is a really fun um, reaction to study because the starting complex is deep blue color in solution. When you cool the solution down to about minus 40, it turns this really deep red color upon addition of MAO. So there's something, um, a chemical change that happens very rapidly. Upon stirring this reaction for about an hour at minus 40, this solution turns to a green color indicating that there is an, another chemical change happening. And if you increase that, that solution, the temperature to room temperature, then now we generate this teal color solution. So I, I won't go into too much details, but I was able to freeze the samples and measure EPR, measure, uh, get EPR data. And what I learned was that both of these species are chromium three. Perhaps this is a, a trialkylated product, whereas the green species is perhaps the um, cationic uh, activated species. And we're still not really sure what the um, final form of the complex is. And so that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of the background of, of, of where I come from. And so in the rest of the today's webinar, I kind of try to distill down on this really complicated process of ligand design to five steps in a, a way that's as simple as possible. And so my recommendation when you approach a ligand design project is to first, step one, list the desired features. So what do you want in your ligand and ultimately in your complex or in your catalyst? And then that will lead to step two, which is then to check if that ligand exists already in the literature. So of course, if it's already known, then you can save yourself a lot of work not having to go through the design and the synthesis. But unfortunately, in a lot of cases where you're designing specialized ligands for a very particular purpose, it probably doesn't exist. And so you'll need to design your ligand and then um, that's going to be followed by step four, which is synthesis and characterization. And then step five is to test and optimize your ligand and ultimately your complex. So here is a, a good uh, point to, to stop before I continue is to have another audience poll. And my question that I'd like you to answer is, which of these five steps do you think um, is the most important and which is the most difficult? And so I would just like to get your opinion on what you think um, is 
important and which one do you think is, is difficult? Okay, so some interesting responses here. Um, most important, step three seems to be the major choice. Most difficult, step four. All right, so I'm gonna actually um, ask you to hold on to your thoughts. Um, we'll discuss that in the breakout session and at the end. So thank you for answering those questions. Okay, so I'm going to go through kind of these five steps in the context of um, my current research in, in, in my group and designing cation tunable catalysts. So our research goal is to develop catalysts that we can we can fine tune in order to obtain um, customized uh, polyolefins. So we want to be able to customize properties such as the polymorphology, which includes things like molecular weight molecular weight distribution and even molecular weight distribution shape because all of these properties affect the ultimate characteristic of that material. We want to be able to affect things like polymer composition because we um, want to be able to make homopolymers, want to make copolymers, perhaps even block polymer, block uh, copolymers or even um, uh, trimers or, or with three monomers. Of course, with um, any catalyst, you also want them to be very active and also uh, thermally stable. In a lot of industrial processes that make polymers, the reactors operate at high temperatures. So actually being able to tolerate really high temperature is a very desirable feature. So in thinking about how we can design a catalyst that's tunable, you know, we learned in the literature that you can do it using redox tuning or using um, you know, chain transfer agents and things like that. But we wondered, what if we simply use a second metal to fine tune the catalyst? As, as inorganic chemists, we know that metals possess many different properties, right? They can differ in geometry, redox potential, acidity, size, yeah. charge, and cooperativity. And so by changing the metals, we ultimately could perhaps um, influence the reactivity at the, the primary catalyst center. So that was the, the dream that we can develop um, a catalyst that we can interchange with different cations. And so here is our wish list. This is what we want our ligand to be able to do and is probably overly ambitious, but this is what we came up with. First, we want to be able to assemble well-defined heterobimetallic species. And um, it's known in the literature that forming heterobimetallic complexes can sometimes be very difficult because you can swap the metals, um, and it's, it's sometimes difficult to selectively metallate at, at specific positions. We would also like to enforce a short metal-metal distance because we envision that maybe they can work cooperatively by, by binding with the same monomer. We want to be able to have a platform that allows us to bind a variety of different metals that we don't have to keep synthesizing different catalysts in order to install different metals. Of course, we want our catalyst or our ligand to give a catalyst that's fast and robust and also easy to synthesize. So that was our wish list, which is step number one. Step number two is to ask, does it exist? So this requires um, a lot of basically literature searching um, to see if, if similar work have, have been done. And so prior to the start of our lab in 2013, this is what we found in the literature. We saw mm -hmm. that um, one of the earliest report was actually by Maurice Brookhart and Johnson in 2003, they reported this PO ligand that's ligated to nickel. And they found that upon uh, the presence of, of, of lithium, they could get enhanced activity for um, olefin polymerization. So of course, this was a very desirable characteristic. Unfortunately, um, we think that having this pendant ether um, simply being a methoxy is, is not a very strong, uh, strong chelator. And so it'd be hard to kinetically stabilize a lot of different metals. And we don't think that this structure would be able to support a variety of, of, of different metals. So that was a potential limitation. We also looked at um, a paper by Nakashima's group in 2005, and they reported the complex shown here 
where the nickel is this metallocycle, but they also have this diimine that's able to accommodate a, second, a secondary metal. And so in this particular paper, they looked at a combination with zinc, cobalt, iron, and nickel. However, they found that in a lot of their um, studies for polymerization, they got bimodal polymers. And that's because they think that both metal sites are catalyzing polymerization. So it's not a single site catalyst. Um, and another downside of this design is that the nickel and the metals, because of the way it's, it's, it's positioned, are spatially separated. So we wouldn't be able to take advantage of any cooperative effects between them. And so, um, you know, when we started to sketch out some possible designs for the ligand that we want, these are some of the, um, the designs we came up with. We like the diimine ligands because they're easy to make. We thought appending a crown ether good would be nice because they're known to, to bind um, really tightly to alkali ions. That's what we were initially, initially targeting. And so these were all, all positive things. However, one, one potential problem with this design is that the crown group is not very pre-organized, right? Notice that this um, arrow arm right here has a single bond. And so if it rotates, um, it's able to rotate freely, we, we won't be able to enforce a short metal metal distance. We thought that might be a potential liability. Um, a similar design that we came up with was shown here. We, we did like the, the crown ether group, um, but we wanted to perhaps look at the phenoxyamine ligand platforms because they've been shown to be good catalysts as well. Um, but this design has a similar problem to the first one, which is that there's free rotation about the single bond. And so we can't enforce a short metal metal distance. We actually try to make, we actually did make this ligand, but we had a difficult time metallating to form the heterobimetallic complex. And we think one of the issues with this one is that the nitrogen here can potentially also bind nickel. And so whenever we try the metallation, it was always a mess. So that was um, unfortunate. The third design that we came up with was to keep the phenoxyimine uh, ligand portion, but we wanted to introduce a polyethylene glycol chain instead. One of the reasons that it's much easier synthetically to access is the linear appendage to the, the ligand platform. Um, and so that made it easier to synthesize. We like the fact that the phenolate um, can bridge the two metals because that can hold the, the metals uh, tightly in place. And then because of the difference in the, the coordination environment, we can selectively metallate. So alkali ions tend to favor oxygen-rich environments, whereas nickel will prefer the um, phenoxyamine chelate. So um, my recommendation when you're designing your ligand is to do a thorough search. And one, one way to do that is to use SciFinder. I think many of you are probably familiar with using uh, this uh, database. And so what you could do is um, draw in the fragment that you're looking for and then see what, what results there are in the literature. So prior to our first publication in 2015, we actually did not find anything with a pendant uh, poly, uh, a, a peg group to a phenoxyamine core. Another really useful tool for um, ligand design is the Cambridge Structural Database. So I, I use this quite often to get some structural information about what the design ligand might look like when I metallate that with the metal, uh, the metal ions. Um, so it works very simple, similar to SciFinder if you've never used the CCDC search engine before, um, but you just draw in your desired structure. In this case, I wanted to see if there's anything that has a crown or a polyethylene group um, coordinated to a transition metal. And so here are, are some of my results for this particular search. I got about 60 hits and you could scroll through the, the different uh, structures and then you could actually visualize the three-dimensional uh, structure of, of those molecules. So you can see here that the one of the search results that I came that, that came up um, did have the fragment I was looking for but wasn't quite the same because this is in a macro cycle. But this was useful because it suggested to me that you know, the alkali ion would be able to be accommodated well within this um, polyethylene glycol chain. So step one through three is mostly um, just literature searching and um, basically critical thinking and design. Step four and five are um, the, uh, the experimental steps. So once we decided to pursue this pegylated phenoxyamine ligand, we decided to make a series of these compounds. So this was work by Amy Kai, who was a previous student in my group. And so we started with this um, salis aldehyde and we can um, al alkylate this phenoxy, uh, phenoxy group with different length uh, linker peg chains. 
So the reason that why we chose these different linkers is because we wanted to coordinate different size cations. We thought it was important to match the cation with the chelate. And so this turned out to be important as I'll show later on. We were able to metallate these ligands pretty easily and we gave, got these square planar nickel complexes. So we had a series of these four different compounds. And so with this in hand, we had to address the question, will these nickel complexes self-assembled into discrete heterobimetallic complexes? Like I said before, um, sometimes you get scrambling or sometimes you can get the assembly of multinuclear clusters, which is not exactly what we want. So we can structurally characterize the starting complex as expected is it has a square planar um, environment. But to study the binding of the second metal, we turn to solution metal titration studies. So for this experiment, what we did is we did a solution titration um, in ether and, and, and watch the titration by UV-vis absorption spectroscopy. So this is our, our experimental data. The black trace is the starting nickel complex, just in solvent. And then as we add in aliquots of sodium barfate, barfate is just a large non corning anion. And as we add in the salt, we start to see optical changes, which suggests that there's some kind of coordination interaction um, between the nickel complex and sodium plus. But if you look really carefully, initially we do see an isospecific point, which is quite nice. But as we add in more sodium, we see that we lose the isospecific point. And so the significance of this is that we can fit these titration data to a, uh, a binding model. And we use Dynafit to do this fitting. And we think that at least these data suggest that the binding is not simply uh, an A to B type of, of coordination where actually we might have actually a, a different, another species. And chemically, um, our proposal is that maybe we do form the desired nickel sodium complex but because the nickel and the, the peg group right here is so flexible that it can bind another nickel to get a trinuclear species. So that was the working hypothesis at the time. But notice in this slide that nickel two only has two ethylene groups, right? However, we found that if we looked at the nickel four with a longer peg chain, this time we got a different result. As we add in the sodium, this is the starting trace in the black, but when we apply addition of sodium, we do get optical changes suggesting coronation. But now we have very clean, very clear isospecific points. And so that was nice because that suggested that at least with nickel four, it selectively binds sodium to form a new, a single species, which would be consistent with the nickel sodium. Of course, the solution um, studies is not enough to um, confirm the structures of these complexes. We relied on X-ray crystallography as well. So uh, through some sort of trial and error, we would identify conditions that allowed us to grow crystals of these complexes. We found that upon addition of one equivalent of the sodium salt, we were able to grow the crystal of the nickel sodium. And here is the molecular structure. Um, you see that the sodium sits really nicely in this pocket defined by the peg group, and then the, the nickel is unperturbed. We do see a pi uh, sodium interaction here, but actually during catalysis, this gets removed. So this is not relevant um, during polymerization, but this is a, provides a nice looking structure at least. To get evidence for the trinuclear species, we simply added half equivalents of the sodium and we were able to grow the crystal of that. And so this is what we saw. Turned out that two of the nickel complexes are binding to a sodium that's bridged because of the two peg chains on both complexes. So that was really good. We were able to confirm the structures um, in a solid state as well as in solution. So um, we have a good sense of, of what's present in, in solution. So that of course leads us to the last step, which is to test the ligand in the complex and to optimize if, if necessary. And so to test the complex, what we did is we ran the polymerization in um, 100 PSI of ethylene, this is low enough pressure that we can actually run in a glass reactor. Um, to activate the complex, we add nickel cod, which scavenging, scavenges the triphenylphosphines, and that opens up a coronation site so that the polymerization can initiate. So here are some of our results. So we saw that with the nickel only complex, the polymerization gave us this really flaky semi-crystalline material, which is very common for uh, semi-crystalline polyethylene. When we add in the sodium, in addition to the nickel, we saw that the product was visually very different. 
So now it's this sort of very um, sticky amorphous material. And so clearly there's, there's, a, there's a really significant change that's occurred upon the addition of the sodium. For um, open polymerization, these are the typical parameters that we like to look at. So for example, we like to measure the cast activity. We like to look at the polymer branching, uh, the molecular weight of the polymer, and the polydispersity of the polymer. So as you look at these numbers down here, upon addition of the sodium, we do see enhancement in activity, which is always a good thing. Um, we see quite a, a large increase in the branching. So 82 carbons per 1,000 or 82 branches per 1,000 carbon versus 19 carbons per 1,000 carbon. The molecular weight goes up a little bit, 4.7 versus 3. And this is kind of unusual because usually what we see is that when branching goes up, molecular weight goes down. But in our case, it looks like we were able to um, enhance both properties. Um, in, in, in polyolefins uh, catalysis, if the polydispersity is around 2, then we say that it's a single site catalyst. It's certainly not a living catalyst, but it's still a single species that's doing the polymerization. And so, um, you know, these, the results that, that, that I had just talked about were, of course, very encouraging, but there were some challenges. So the, the encouraging aspects were that the cations that when we added did enhance activity and were able to modulate branching and molecular weight. Um, and so this is, is ultimately what we want in our tunable catalyst. The polymer dispersity is low, which is suggestive of a single site catalyst. So even with two metals, uh, we think that only one site is, is doing the polymerization. The limitations or the challenges that remained were the absolute activity is still very low. So even though it did enhance activity, um, there are many cats in the literature that are, are much, much faster and much more efficient. We found that these complexes are actually not very good catalysts for polar olefins. So they actually shut down when you add things like methyl acrylate um, or allyl alcohols. And we also have nuclearity control issues, right? Remember in the previous slide, we, we weren't able to control the um, formation of the trinuclear uh, dinickel uh, alkali complex. So here's a good stopping point for um, another poll question, and that is, given what I've just talked about, to improve our system, would you, what would you do next? Would you A, try to modify the nickel complex? Would you try to test other secondary metals? Because we only looked at alkali ions. Should we maybe try a different approach? Maybe look at a different ligand platform? Or do you think this is just too difficult of a problem and we should just give up and, and, and be done with it? Um, of course, other ideas are also helpful. So um, please go ahead and answer that question. Okay, fantastic. It looks like the suggestion is to test other secondary metals or to modify the phenoxyamine catalyst. Fantastic. All right, so that's actually what we did. So we decided that um, the first thing we would do is just to modify our phenoxyamine platform and see if we can optimize it and, and get some better reactivity. And so we found that when we bulked up the complex, which is adding these sterically encumbering groups, we did make the complex more, more active. So that's really fantastic. Unfortunately, it still did not work well with polar olefins. In fact, um, there are no examples in the literature where the phenoxyamines can actually do copolymerization with things like methyl acrylate. So um, I think that's just an inherent limitation of these uh, catalysts. We also try a different ligand platform um, by first looking in the literature to see what are some other um, candidates that would work for this chemistry. And for, so we, for this, we came across work by Rich Jordan's group. And they reported in this 2014 paper um, that using this phosphine phosphonate ester ligand, they were able to generate a palladium complex that can do polymerization of uh, methyl acrylate. So in this report, they were able to get 2.6 mole percent incorporation of methyl acrylate um, into this polyethylene uh, material. So we really liked this structure because we wanted to replace the ethoxy groups with uh, a peg chain. And so you can see how we can now kind of incorporate our strategy of introducing a second metal using now this, this more kinetically stabilizing uh, pegylated version. And so I have to give a lot of credit to my student, um, Amy, who did this work. I'm reporting to Imogram Metallics. And just to summarize all of that beautiful work, 
Um, what she found was that this complex is actually active up to 140 degrees Celsius, which is actually quite unusual for these type of catalysts. Unfortunately, the incorporation of polar olefins did not improve. So too bad. Um, we had to consider something else. We know from the literature that often when you replace the palladium with nickel, the cast activity enhances. And so this is work by Dao Wei Xiao and his, he was in my lab um, in 2019. So Dao Wei was able to make this derivative using nickel allyl as a pre-catalyst. And so what he found was that this catalyst is actually um, a lot, quite a lot more active than palladium, but he was able to actually work in neat THF um, a lot of polymerizations reported are done in non-polar solvents, so being able to use THF was really helpful because that allowed us to use other secondary metals, which is one of the pole responses. And so this allowed us to, to screen a, a variety of transition metals, um, P-block metals, and F-block metals. And our result, um, what we saw was that upon addition of zinc or cobalt, we were able to get the uh, greatest enhancement in activity. So those were, were very exciting results. However, uh, Dao Wei further did some structural characterization to try to get an understanding of what the structure looks like. And so um, what he found with the nickel system is that upon crystallization of sodium barfate, we got the molecular structure shown here. So the nickel is, is binding to the phosphine and the oxygen as expected. But what was surprising is that the sodium was bound by the PEG units, but there were no, it was not bridged by this um, central oxygen. So because of a lack of the bridging atom, that means that the metal-metal separation is extremely large. And unfortunately, that means that the presence of the alkali ion will not really impact the activity of the nickel catalyst. So you know, that was kind of a, um, a, a disappointing result, but that's OK. That's what happens in ligand design. You just have to take this iterative approach to kind of optimize and test and optimize and make any modifications necessary. And so um, another potential platform that we considered was this phosphine phenolate ligand um, bound to nickel. And we like this example because there are several reports that it can do copolymerization of methylacrylate and ethylene to give a copolymer. In fact, in a paper by Shimitsu in 2017, they reported a 4.5 mole percent incorporation, which was, of course, um, a very desirable result. Um, Yu Sheng Li's group in 2018 reported even higher uh, incorporation of, of about 14% more incorporation. Unfortunately, in this paper, they didn't actually report the molecular weight, so we're not really sure if this is a, a ligamer or if it's truly a, a, a polymer, um, but at least these were are very encouraging uh, results. But we like this platform also because we can easily incorporate our polyethylene glycol chains because we can use what we've learned from our previous studies um, to enhance this, this system. So there are a couple of things that we like about the proposed catalyst. One is that we know this PO complex is capable of doing polar open copolymerization. So if you start with a, a catalyst that works, then you can only um, go up from there, hopefully. We, we, we learned from previous studies that this triethylene glycol uh, chain is good for alkali iron binding. So we, that saves us a little bit of work not having to find the optimal linker length. Um, we introduced a, a bridge, a carbon atom here because we thought that maybe by changing the bite angle, um, we might prevent the formation of that di-nickel um, alkali species. And then furthermore, the arrow groups here provide opportunities for more traditional uh, steric tuning because uh, we want to block the axial sites of, of the nickel complex. So I have to give a lot of credit for uh, T. Tran for doing a lot of this beautiful work. T is also a member of the center, so we're very uh, glad to have him for, this, um, for the CIC. So um, T was able to make this complex. It did take a bit of effort. It took, I think, about seven or eight steps, so it was a non-trivial synthesis. And so to establish the, um, the coordination, we did some more um, solution binding studies. And one of the experiments that we can do is the job plot um, experiment or job plot analysis using the method of continuous variation. Basically, what this method in involves is just keeping your nickel and your alkaline ion ratio um, con con concentrations the same, but vary their relative ratios. And so we see down here um, the molar ratio of, of, the, of nickel. If the peak of that um, peak 
is at 0.5, this suggests that the optimal binding store geometry is one to one, which supports you know, our desired uh, complex of this heterobimetallic. So for this, uh, these experiments or these studies, we looked at the entire series, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. Um, we did not look at rubidium. We were also able to obtain um, X-ray characterization of some of these complexes. Here is the example with uh, lithium. You see that it sits really nicely in this pocket provided by the peg chain, and you also see the square planar nickel. The cesium, as you expect, is a larger cation, right? So it's going to open up this um, unit a little bit more. Um, and then this uh, crystallization of this complex, we did it in, pen in um, benzene. So we do see an aryl um, interaction with the uh, cesium. We were lucky enough that we were able to get X-ray structures for the entire series. And so that allowed us to do a, uh, a, a stirred volume or a stirred bulk um, quantification using percent varied volume. So in case you don't know what this is, this percent varied volume you can calculate using a program called SAMB uh, VCA. And you can read about um, how this works um, by work by Cavallo. But basically, the percent variable volume allows us to determine the relative stirred bulk of ligands by determining um, what percentage of the coronation sphere is occupied by that ligand. So in this very simple example, we've got this n ligand coordinate to a metal complex, um, such as a ruthenium. And you would get, as a result, something that looks like this. So this is a steric map. So we're looking down the z-axis right here. So this is the x-axis and the y-axis. And what we're basically seeing is an NHC ligand in the back. And from this heat map, the red is the portion that has more steric bulk, because that's, that's in, in the front. And then the blue, it has less steric bulk. And then the parts that are a white just means that there is no steric bulk in that region. Right? So the, this, um, this environment here is open. So we did this calculation for a series of these complexes. We looked at in addition to our complexes, sort of the conventional ones. So we have the pentafluorophenol, which is N5. We have the tert-butyl, which is N6, which is, these are, are well known or well studied in the literature. So we just wanted to see relative to ours, what is the percent varied volume. And so the calculation gave us a percent about 43 to 44. Um, this initially was kind of surprising. I thought that perhaps um, the tert-butyl would be a little sterically bulkier, but based on this calculation, sterically, um, it's, it's similar in terms of the buried volume. We were unable to get calculation for the nickel-7 complex because um, the starting complex is not crystalline, so we can't grow crystals of it. However, as expected, when we add in the, the lithium, sodium, potassium, or cesium, the buried volume does increase. In fact, if we use our largest cation, um, which is the cesium, we can get about 20% increase in buried volume compared to um, per, 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 the tert butyl group, which is traditionally considered a bulky substituent. So that was kind of interesting. We also were able to measure the, um, the change in electronic density of the nickel by cyclic voltammetry. Um, so it did take some effort by T to kind of optimize these conditions to, to get good data. But so to summarize the data, I have this table here. There are not a lot of numbers, but I just want to focus your attention to this column. So here we're looking at the change in redox potential relative to nickel seven. So we're using nickel seven as our benchmark. And so I'll set that as zero. So for the nickel five complex, which has the pentafluorophenol, it increases the redox potential about 76 millivolts, which makes sense, right? If it's electron withdrawing, it's gonna be easier to reduce the nickel. It turns out that the turbutyl doesn't really um, modify the electronics very much. So it's very similar to nickel seven. When we add in the alkali ions, as expected, because they're Lewis acids, the redox potentials do increase relative to nickel seven. Um, in fact, what was surprising to me was that with lithium, we can get a, a greater increase in redox potential than the pentafluorophenol. And so this was kind of encouraging that we could modulate the electron, electronic environment of the nickel by the selection of the appropriate cation. So um, of course, um, that leads us to step five, which is to test and, and potentially optimize. So for testing, we did our polymerization in, with ethylene. We add in our nickel cod to activate, and this was done at, at 30 degrees Celsius for one hour. There's a lot of data here, but let me just walk you through it really quickly. So we're comparing the standard catalyst, nickel five and nickel six, 
and also heterobimetallic complexes. And so what we see is that the nickel five and nickel six um, were certainly not as active as our, our lithium. Our lithium is actually um, significantly much more active and much more productive um, than the standard complexes. When we add in the different uh, ions, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, cesium, their activities do change. Um, the cesium actually does have some activity, but on this scale, it looks like it's not active, but it actually is. If we look at the branching, um, this was very encouraging because when we add in different alkali ions, we do change their relative branching from about 30 or so to low about uh, 10 or a little bit below. We also see changes in the molecular weight of the polymers. Um, it seems like the highest was from the lithium and from the cesium, and the low was with um, sodium and with potassium. So this was all very encouraging. And so that's kind of where I wanted to stop um, in the terms of our work. Um, just to summarize this portion, um, our catalyst system displays high activity and productivity, is robust, is cation responsive, and we have good nuclearity control. In some un unpublished work, we're able to now show that cation tuning can precisely modulate polymer molecular weight without chain transfer agents, and I think this is going to be a pretty big deal um, in distribution. However, the take-home message here is that the importance of ligand design in our work cannot be overstated. And I know I'm running a little bit long, but I want to just finish off with this one last slide, and that, that is, how is ligand design going to be relevant to um, our goals for the center of integrated catalysis? So here's a general scheme of what we hope to accomplish in the center. We want to be able to have multi-catalysts integrated into one a single system where we could essentially do cascade reactions, right? We want to be able to take compound number one, convert it to compound number two, transport it to a second catalyst, convert it to a, a third product, transport that to uh, the final catalyst and, and obtain the final material. So um, there are several areas where I think ligand design will be really, really critical to getting these systems to work. Uh, one is that we're interested in CAS immobilization. And so there's going to be a lot of ligand design figuring out you know, the length of the chain and the type of linkers to use to attach it to solid state supports. We want to be able to introduce temporal control um, in our reactions, and that's going to require us to switch the CAS on and off. So that's going to require ligand design for us to incorporate different elements of switching, either a redox switch or a photo switch or a cation switch. Um, so there are lots of possibilities. And then last, we, we might also want to be able to affect substrate selectivity. So that might include ligand design to change the coronation environment of the catalyst. So I know I went really fast um, and, and we're short on time, um, but hopefully we still have five minute, uh, have time for a five minute breakout session. And so what I hope um, to, to happen in this breakout session is to have a discussion either on um, a topic of your choosing or if you want to discuss some of these questions. So um, the poll questions about which step do you think is the most important or most difficult, or perhaps you have other recommendations for us, um, or perhaps you have uh, need ideas for your own ligand design problems. Um, so if it's okay, we can break out into our breakout sessions now. Loy, um, I don't know how other people did with their breakout sessions, I already have two excellent questions from my breakout session for you. So the um, you guys can hear me. Everybody is. Uh, it, it's really hard. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think a general, very interesting question came from Wujin Lee, and I would like him to ask ask it first. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, great talk to introduce your. Um, ethylene trimerization and which is applicable in industry area possibly and I, I was just curious like uh, as an inorganic chemist how do people uh, establish establish the hypothesis to work in the lab how do they find the interesting topic to work on to initiate I was just yeah curious <laughs> Loy, you're muted. <laughs> you're still muted. Still muted. <laughs> How about now? Yeah, I can. Okay. I can hear you. Technology is hard, so I'm sorry. 
But um, yeah, so one, one piece of advice when I give students when they're trying to pick projects and think about interesting topics is first, what gets them really excited, right? So for you, is it health? Is it energy? Is it materials? And then, you know, within that, that, that narrow scope, pick a problem that's unsolved, right? So what, what challenge, um, you know, needs, needs more innovation or is there some fundamental question that hasn't been answered? Um, so I, I, were you asking that question more specifically or just kind of in general, how do you think about research questions? Just kind of general research questions, yeah. Because uh, I'm an organic chemist, so maybe uh, people have different perspective to think about right. the research initiation. So I was just curious, as an inorganic chemist, how do they, how do they think about their uh, research initiation and their? Right. Uh, so I, I don't know if the, the other uh, CIC members want to want to jump in, but um, for me, it, it's mostly problem driven. So what is the scientific question? Um, and will it have a big impact if I'm successful in answering that question? That's how I think about science and research anyway. I have a difference actually, uh, philosophy. I kind of think about what are cool things that are underdeveloped and then what applications might be useful for them. So, you know, uh, we were talking in our session about how, what are alternatives to traditional ligands, right? So we have for, for decades, we've talked about steric and electronics and Lloyd did a beautiful job of showing how that can affect activity and selectivity. But what, it, what are different ways that you can control selectivity and activity that don't involve ligands? So that's something that I find interesting and potentially useful. Yeah, well, one thing I didn't mention in my talk is that there's, you can do a lot of reaction engineering as well, right? So you can change things like pressure, temperature, um, you know, flow um, has been used to, to tune polymerizations. So there are lots of other non ligand based ways to um, affect the chemical process. Any other groups want to share their thoughts? Actually, I, I have. Oh, um, so I, I started from, you know, Adam and Eve. I told him how I was a student and actually started uh, as an organic student. Really? <laughs> and then I just got more interested in organometallic chemistry because I thought when I was a student at least or organic chemistry was too much trial and error for my uh, days. <laughs> so um, I guess I was similar because I, I went, didn't know he was an organic student. Maybe I shouldn't have bad mouth <laughs> organic <laughs> chemistry that much. Right. It's <laughs> so, important without organic chemistry, we can't make our ligands. Right. Um, so I had the, as, as someone who's in it, technically in the organic division at Boston College. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna stand up for my organic chemistry colleagues and say, you know, it, it, it's all a, a, a perspective of what problems you really want to solve, I think. Yeah, and I think they, both think Jeff that. and Lloyd put it much more elegantly than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of room for both uh, philosophies, you know, that Lloyd presented and what I presented and, and, and a lot of things in between when coming up with your own ideas. I think, but at the end of the day, right, Loy and Paula and Alex probably would all agree, you wanna figure out something that you're passionate about. There's nothing worse than kind of slogging through something that you're not really excited about doing. Exactly, right. So just don't jump on like the latest hot topic just because everybody, you know, is working on it. Well, and I actually, I'm going to make a plug for our center. I think the idea for the center came out, came exactly from that desire to work on problems that we are interested about, but we cannot tackle on our own. So, um, yeah. I have, an, um, I have another question from my uh, breakout session, Loy. This is more specific. So Scott Chap asked uh, um, a, an interesting question. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, my question was more along the lines of with your crystal structures, whether or not you were able to uh, determine whether there was a metal-metal bond in any of your uh, structures and whether or not you think that a metal-metal bond was uh, important for your catalysis. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think in some of our structures, we do have pretty close interactions, um, but we didn't really look at it very closely. Um, we, we have some, I think one was like a chloride bridge and I think that's probably pretty close. But to answer your question, we just don't know. We haven't looked into that. 
but you might be right. There might be some interesting metal metal interactions that we were not um, haven't considered yet. But thank you for that suggestion. Um, my group also had a question. Uh, it was about the metal, the choices of metal. And uh, Malcolm, can can you share your question with us? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, this, is a, this is a really cool talk, Lloyd. So I appreciate it. Um, Actually, I, if you guys can also tell us where you are from, um, since we are hoping you're not all from our parent <laughs> institution, that would make us feel very good about your participation in the webinar as well. <laughs> right. Well, then this is like twofold. I work for um, Dr. Tim Brewster at the University of Memphis. Oh, uh, nice. Welcome. Yeah, my, I'm Malcolm. I'm in my last year now, so that's exciting. But uh, so I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned one, you mentioned that you have tried in your bimetallic stuff, you've swapped out your ancillary metal ligand, meaning not the nickel one, right? For like various different ones. You said P block, D block, even F block stuff. Mm -hmm. I worked with aluminum. That's like almost all of my dissertation actually as the second metal in my stuff. So is aluminum one of the ones you tried? Cause it's all, it's also does like redox active. Yeah. Stuff yeah. Yeah. Great question. We did actually, we looked at aluminum um, in addition to a list of, of a bunch of others. So right. the reason that we started with the alkaline ions is mostly because of solubility um, because we're working in toluene and nonpolar solvents. And oh, so okay, yeah. there are very few salts that would dissolve. And so for a really long time, we could never do anything other than plus one cations. Right. But then with Dalway's discovery that we can actually run it in T-Chef, that opened up a lot more options. And so we, we did screen them. The problem right now is that we don't have really good predictive power. So it's sort of just like a, a, a screen and, and test type of deal. You know, we can't say, okay, we think that zinc is gonna give us the best properties. So let's try that one. Um, so right now we're not sophisticated enough to pick or predict okay okay and then so that okay that makes sense that makes sense and then another question i had was how like um i don't know how to phrase this how lot how sold are you on nickel specifically like my boss like i love dr brewster like i do he's awesome <laughs> He's very iridium, like if it's not in group, uh, like what is it, D, if it's not D9, like he doesn't even look at it. So I'm very curious, like yeah, yeah. if you've ever, if you've considered, sorry, I think I'm in an apartment and like there's like uh, somebody's cutting the grass behind my apartment or something, but uh, have you considered instead of swapping the ancillary ligand going back to what's worked for you with nickel and then changing nickel to something else? I see. That's an interesting suggestion, and we haven't actually considered that, but I, I, I'd say, why not? Um, we're not really restricting ourselves to any particular metal. We right. like the um, nickel and palladium because it, they tend to be pretty well behaved and it's well studied in the literature, so we kind of know what to, what to expect. But there are examples of open polymerization catalysts with first row metals, um, like iron and cobalt. Um, but potentially, that's a fantastic suggestion. We can look at those, because once you have the ligand, if they can metalate and they yeah, are stable. theoretically swap them out for literally yeah. any of the elements in the table, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Right. That's a really great suggestion because maybe it's going to give us some really different properties, right? Than just a right. traditional nickel or the palladium. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Okay, those are all my questions. Thanks so much. Great. Yeah, thanks for the great question. Thanks, Malcolm. Okay, any other brave warriors? <laughs> hey, I have a question from the, I mean, follow up from the first participant of the, I mean, who asked the question. Uh -huh. So my question is sometimes there are a lot of problems or even one problem, but people have posed like a lot of solutions to that. Uh -huh. And, but there is no single consensus, right? I mean, people have different opinions about one particular problem and its solution. Uh -huh. Right. So if I, I feel always that if I am going to solve that problem, it means I am going to make like uh, another solution and that is not also going to be like give a consensus because the other people have some evidences and then on right. the basis of those evidences, they have given their conclusion, right? Right. So so in that case, what, what the new researchers should do? I mean, for example, even if, they found a problem, they found that there is a question that is not answered yet, or uh -huh. even if it is answered yet, but there is no agreement yet. Right. So, so what should we do? Can you please give a suggestion yeah. on that? 
That's another fantastic question. And I think part of that is what is your philosophy on research and how do you think about research problems? Um, I, I think that, that that speaks to why research is so interesting because we can tackle problems from so many different perspectives, right? There's no one right way to solve a research problem. And I think that actually this is why we have to center and we have people from such different backgrounds because we're hoping that with our very diverse training and, 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 um, and background that we can solve problems where maybe we would not be able to do individually. Um, and so I think you, you're very correct that research is extremely complicated and there are so many ways that you can think about a solution to problems. Um, sure the other PIs can, can add more to that. I also want to say, um, I, have a, I have a saying, I came up with it. Um, maybe I heard somebody. Um, I don't know if it will necessarily make sense, but ideas are cheap, but actually execution of an idea is really expensive. And not just expensive, but really important. So for example, even for this center, there are certain ideas we're working on it's not like we, I mean, we came up with details on how to execute them, but the main ideas are not super new, for example. I mean, um, I don't know if you, how many of you have seen um, when I try to give examples of integrated catalysis. I mean, we're not the first ones to think about how to do cascades of reactions and how to combine reactions, right? But we're hoping we're the first, well, and even if you're, we're not the first ones, we're the first ones to teach the community something new. So this, I think, goes back to Lo, how Loy explained it. Um, I think you can, I mean, if you get lucky enough and you can raise money to work on some idea that excites you and excites other people, um, then you should make the best of it. And you know, there are many, many great problems to work on, um, but you have to get up in the morning and be excited about the day ahead. That's kind of how I see it. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah. And where are you from, Amir? He's, he's from UCLA, right, Amir? UCLA. Yeah, yeah, I am from UCLA. Yeah, he's Thanks not for from um, my group or Chang's group. Which group are you? Chang with? Group. Yeah, I am from Professor Duan group. All right. Right. Um, okay. Do we have other questions? We had lots of breakout rooms, so nobody else had um, any questions. No. Okay. Well, hopefully next time we'll um, have more questions. But even so, this is much better than before, right? I think we had some very nice discussion after the webinar. Yeah, that's and, really great. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and we'll do the, so those of you who join us today, um, we're going to do another webinar in a month. We're going to do polling of the audience again and breakout rooms. Um, so please join us again and tell your friends and um, yeah. Um, oh, who's next? Who's, who's up next on the mind? Let's see. Uh, should be a materials. Chong, maybe? I think I'm the next person. Yeah. Next. <laughs> I'm going to talk about completely different about how do you see materials to do something else. Yeah, the schedule. Yeah, there you there you go. Yeah, so Chang, yeah, we 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 are going to alternate between organometallic and materials. So, okay, so next one, right at the end of probably classes will be done by then. So. Hopefully people will be interested, still in the mood to learn more before um, <laughs> they Christmas start uh, <laughs> going into holiday. It'd be a great Christmas gift. Yeah, <laughs> right, <yeah>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Um, I have a, and, a question uh, quickly. Are you guys gonna do that, like continue to do this? Act like, so Alex is the last one who also knows my boss, so that's great. Um, <laughs> uh, are, like, so, because this is really, like, I really have enjoyed these. And, and I'm curious, like, I don't know if group meeting is the right word, but like, I don't know, 
like once Alex is done in was January, February, like if somebody finds something new or something cool happens, like would you all be like? Right. So here, here's the idea. Um, we actually are going to have the webinar series series um, once a month. Um, it's going after Alex talks in February. It's going to be a combination between updates from either our own research groups or from the center and um, inviting people who do work that we think it's um, relevant to what we do in the center. And they will all still be tutorial style. Awesome. So a combi basically um, a little bit more, I think, background than what you would see in a seminar at a university. Right. Um, but also a lot of research from that person's group. So yeah, we are. This is going to keep going for as long as the center um, is going. <laughs> and yeah, so if you have suggestions and if you're interested um, in like some topic, you know, send any of us an email. Okay. It's actually the students are going to organize it starting in March. Well, starting now, but with the March webinar. So we can pass your suggestions and anybody's suggestions along and they can discuss and decide who, whom to invite. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I guess goodbye and see you guys in a month. Bye. Bye everyone.